pray, Father God, we love you. We, we've heard about the gospel our whole lives. But Lord, I pray that, that this day, we, be, we can begin to just get a glimpse of the full gospel. And what it is, what it is that made that first Acts church, the church in Acts, that first century church, so willing to give up everything that they are, everything that they have to spread. Father God, we love you. We praise you. We pray for your Holy Spirit in this moment now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <coughs> so in the single most iconic moment of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, which I'm just going to let you know right now, I love. <laughs> Gandalf leads a fellowship of men, hobbits, elves, and dwarves through the dark mines of Moria. Now I know Lord of the Rings might not be everyone's cup of tea, but follow me. It is perhaps the most thrilling and terrifying moment in his whole story, and though that story actually is barely a quarter of the way in. You see, when all seems bleakest for Gandalf and Frodo and the small fellowship, a gargantuan demon from the deepest depths of hell appears. A Balrog. The creature seeks not merely to stop the progress of the tiny band, but ulti ultimately to kill them all. Now Tolkien himself denied that his epic was allegory in the same manner as his friend C.S. Lewis, like his Narnia, or even going back further to John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, or even Hannah Hernard's great, and I love this book, Hind's Feet for High Places. However, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings does aim to retell what we call the Great Controversy by means of symbols steeped in a Christ-centered worldview. It may, it may not be entirely allegorical, but Tolkien admits to filling his epic story with allegorical biblical moments. This particular moment, the standoff between the Balrog and Gandalf is one of the greatest. The Balrog represents Satan himself, who comes face to face with Gandalf the Grey, who of course represents Christ in this moment. The two meet up on a stone bridge that precariously connects two worlds, that of light and that of darkness. All hope for the world quivers in this moment. Now the Balrog aims to cross the bridge to destroy the faithful band and to bring an end to Gandalf's effort to destroy evil, symbolized by a ring, and Gandalf's effort to save the world. But Gandalf bravely stands in the Balrog's path across the bridge. He plants his staff in the ground and then fixes himself firmly between the dark figure before him and the faithful fellowship behind him. There, Gandalf pronounces loudly, and I would say, if you've seen the film brilliantly, portrayed by Sir Ian McKellen, he says, You cannot pass. I am a servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Andor, and you cannot pass. The dark fire will not avail you. Go back to the shadow. You cannot pass. How many remember that scene at all? Okay, quite a few. Now in the most recent film made by Peter Jackson, he actually altered Tolkien's line a little bit, which knowing Tolkien enough, he would have been very bugged by. <laughs> But instead of saying, you cannot pass, 
he changed it to, you shall not pass. And he does so in order to give the line an even more epically biblical overtime, uh, over, uh, uh, overtone. And I actually think the change is effective. J.R.R. Tolkien was a devout lover, lover of Jesus and the gospel. As a literature professor, he also loved good story. Both he and his dearest friend, C.S. Lewis, represent, in my mind, the pinnacle of what I call story apologetics. In short, as John Bunyan did before them, they are defending God by means of storytelling. Even non-believers who read either Tolkien or Lewis cannot help but wrestle with the one true God. In Tolkien's story, the Balrog attempts to defy Gandalf's command. He defiantly steps onto the stone bridge. The bridge collapses beneath his weight and the demon tumbles down into hell. However, the Balrog's whip lashes around the legs of Gandalf. The faithful are freed. The transformation of the world has commenced, but the conflict drags Gandalf down into hell itself. This is Tolkien's Golgotha moment. Tolkien's goal is not to retell the gospel account, but rather to express through storytelling what Jesus actually accomplished on the cross. And what did he accomplish? So much more than we give him credit for. In that moment of extreme torment, terror, and death at Golgotha, Jesus informs Lucifer and his cohorts they can advance no further. You shall not pass. None fully grasp this, but the battle has turned. From this point on, Christ's victory is secured even if all seem lost to the faithful. There is so much truth in the words that Jesus spoke. It is finished. Now here's a spoiler alert. Gandalf later comes back to life and reappears to his followers just like Jesus. He comes back as Gandalf from, well, first of all, he's Gandalf the Grey, but he comes back as Gandalf the White in his ultimate transformation moment. Now, my purpose in recounting the story is not to appeal to the inner geek in some of us, <laughs> but rather to address what Jesus has truly accomplished at the cross and then at the tomb from which he walked away alive. What did he accomplish? Everything. Everything. The church has failed miserably in sharing the best news one can ever tell about Jesus' victory at Golgotha, about his fatal blow to Lucifer and his worldview. We have failed to even grasp why the good news is news at all, let alone what makes it good. To our shame, we have shared with the world a half gospel. Remarkable, yes, but incomplete. Far worse, We've actually come to believe in this half gospel ourselves. Let me attempt to summarize what I'm calling a half gospel. Let us call it the pretty good news. See if this half gospel sounds familiar. Jesus came to earth, he died in my place because of my sin. He was buried in a tomb, but he rose again three days later. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father. And because of this, Jesus forgives me of my sin. Every bit of that is good news. Every bit. Every bit of that is true. However, there's more. So much more. Forgiveness of sin is very much good news. It is, quite frankly, extraordinary news. 
And I can cite scripture as the source for this delightful news. John articulates it so well when he writes this in his first letter. He writes, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's good news, is it not? Amen. Later on, later on, he writes this, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So Jesus died, was buried, was raised, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father as our personal advocate. Thus, while everyone sins, Jesus forgives. As the bumper sticker says, I'm not forgiven, or I'm not perfect, just forgiven. So why, let me ask, is the world unimpressed by this? Frankly, why are most professed Christians not particularly moved by this? Before you think I'm in any way diminishing the gospel, hear me out, please. We teach you the good news. We preach the good news. We sing good news. Because it is good news. Indeed, God has done what only God could do. He has made possible the forgiveness of our sins. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but that is fantastic news. He took on our punishment and accomplished something none but he could do. He exhausted the full resources of evil itself. Hallelujah. Amen. Put another way, he took upon himself the full weight of evil at its worst. And hallelujah, evil is no match for the Messiah. All right. Put it in another way, no evil can stand up to the grace and forgiveness of Jesus. And please don't bring up here the so-called unpardonable sin. If you are concerned about it, then you probably haven't committed it. <laughs> Period. That's good news. Really, 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 really good news. So the question is, why is the world so unmoved by this? Why is the world so ho-hum about it? Why are Christians often unmoved by it? Is it possible that we're not sharing it in a hip enough way? Do we need cooler songs? Smoke machines and lights? Some churches are trying that. Do we need better looking preachers? <laughs> Not a single amen. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Do we need clever billboards or slick ads in theaters? Super Bowl TV spots. You know what? The apostles didn't have that. You know what they did have, though? The gospel in full. All of it. Every beautiful ounce of it. Not a half. The forgiveness of sins is such good news. Freedom from the fear of punishment is good news. A clear conscience is good news. But it's only half the story. For many, the forgiveness of sins is an ethereal good. A theoretical good. For many, including some here, I imagine, it seems far removed from one's life, though. Many are grateful that their sins are forgiven, but what about those things that truly weigh me down? Such as, how am I going to pay for my kids' education? Or even feed my kids? What am I going to do with my aging parents? For the new students, how am I going to get through, the new, through this new school year? These are real-life questions. Does the gospel have anything to say about them? And how do I quit my addiction to pornography, to alcohol, to work, to television, 
part of my phone. Because to be honest, that addiction is ripping apart my marriage, my family, and my psyche. It's starting to affect even my work. How do I get a hold of my diet? It seems no matter how hard I try, I fail. And to be honest, healthy people don't understand what it's like. How do I stop feeling so lonely, so anxious, so depressed, so angry, so frightened about the world? I mean, it's killing me. How do I get over this brutal breakup I just went through, this nagging homesickness, the stress at work? How do I stop feeling like crap all the time? If the gospel could just address those things, now that would be good news. Well, if I got good news for you, allow me the honor of introducing you to Jesus, the Messiah, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, God with us. The gospel speaks to our most desperate needs, our most desperate fears, our most desperate flaws. Now think about this for a minute. There are approximately, give or take, 351 prophecies predicting what the Messiah would accomplish, what he would be like, and even where his life and his ministry would occur. The odds of fulfilling a quarter of those prophecies are astronomical. Yet Jesus fulfilled every single one. Everyone. I'm just going to say, I think he's the Messiah. <laughs> but no prophecy in my mind is so clear as the Isaiah servant songs. And the most poignant being Isaiah 53. The whole chapter moves me every single time, over and over and over again. But I want today for you to note verses 4 and 5, where it says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. In this potent and poetic prophecy we learn how the Messiah will be brutally tortured, pierced and crushed, and all on behalf of our sin. My sin. And that's a bitter pill of good news if you ask one but good news nonetheless. But the truly good news comes right there in verse 5 where it says, and by his wounds we are healed. Amen. We're going to dive a little deep in theology here. So hold on, okay? Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf is good news indeed. I mean, if a grand rescue at the end of history is all we hope for, this still remains good news. It's still good news. But Jesus was pierced and crushed for so much more than a rescue at the end of one's life. He took on our iniquities, not merely to grant eternal life, but to grant life right now. All right, amen. The gospel is so much more. Jesus' suffering, though painful to think about, is such good news, we can hardly believe it's true. You see, Jesus' purpose in coming, in giving up himself, in standing between the forces of evil and us, was not merely to forgive us of our sins, but to heal us of our sins. John writes it this way. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sin because God's transforming life goes to work in them. Why would they want to keep on sinning when God's seed is deep within them, making them who they 
are. I love that. Why would they even want to? And Gandalf plants his staff into the ground and rebukes the Balrog. His purpose is not merely to give his friends time to escape. It is to tell that vile demon, you cannot pass. You shall not pass. The cross, the cross is not merely a means to fend off the devil for a season or at life's end. The cross is a line the devil cannot cross over. The good news is so much more than we have been led to believe. You and I are not merely forgiven. We are given power. Divine power by the grace of the living God to be transformed and to overcome sin. There's a false gospel out there. We too often hear and, and fall back on it. I call it the great evangelical cop. It's not always stated outright, but it goes something like this. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Therefore, because sin is inevitable, relax. Be at peace with your sin because we have the grace of forgiveness. Dietrich Bonhoeffer called this cheap grace. It's as if Jesus were to say to the woman caught in adultery, Neither do I condemn you. Now go and try your best. In Romans 6, which is Paul's clearest treatise on sin, he writes, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. Then he says, We are those who who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? In that same chapter, Paul lays it out clearly. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather... Here Paul offers up an alternative to the great evangelical cop-out. It's the full gospel here. But rather, offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin can no longer, and it shall no longer be your master, because you are not under law but under grace. <laughs> the beautiful thing about that is that if you do sin, He is faithful and just to forgive. But you are no longer under law. You are under grace. The gospel of grace, though, is not merely one of forgiveness, but one of transformation, one of healing, one of power. Power to identify rebellion in one's life. Power to pinpoint harmful habits in one's life, and power to break the cycles of sin in your life. Every sin harms. Every idol is devastating to one's joy, to one's relationships, to one's quality of life. From the smallest act of covetousness, to the gravest act of murder, to the slightest act of lust, to the most grievous act of adultery, sin hurts. Sin creates harmful cycles that hurt our children, our friends, our students, our colleagues, ourselves. Make no mistake, many cycles are not your fault or my fault. Addiction often means we are caught in a cycle of sin we inherited. And now we find ourselves hurting others by it. Cycles of sin such as, such as hatred and racism and victimhood are often cycles we have inherited, learned since childhood, and now we are passing those cycles on to others. Sins are, as the second commandment states, passed down to the third and fourth generations. Why? 
because sin sucks. It is the great virus of rebellion against the Most High. But if you think that means you are doomed to live in sin's torment until the end of time, you have not heard the full gospel. If you believe because you were born that way, you must live that way, you have not heard the full gospel. If you believe God accepts you as you are, but it has no intention of radically transforming you, you have not heard the full gospel. If you believe grace is merely God's means to save us and not to transform us, you've not heard the full gospel. I've even heard some, even Christians say, what does it matter if it hurts no one but me? But there is no such thing as sin that hurts no one but me. The wages of sin is death, not because we serve a vindictive God, but because sin is a merciless destroyer. But the full gospel not only stops sin in its tracks, it sends it back to hell where it belongs. Herein lies the gospel of Jesus. Herein lies the gospel of the apostles, Peter, James, John, and Paul. The gospel, the good news is this, the same power that saves us by grace and not the law, the same power that began this good work in you by grace, that same power intends to finish the good work in you. Amen. Paul, writing to Titus, says this, for the grace of God, the one which brings salvation to all men, appeared, disciplined I don't often think of grace disciplining us so that we may live soberly and righteously and in a godly manner in the current age, in the now age, by denying the ungodliness and the worldly passions. By the grace and power of Jesus Christ, the cycle of sin can and will stop with you. Grace is a saving and disciplining force. It saves and transforms. That is, if you allow Jesus to say to your sin, you shall not pass. Do not mistake this, though, as a renewed call to legalism. Please, you are saved by grace and grace alone. And you will never impress God with your good work. Nor is this a backdoor legalism. And you've heard that, I've heard it my whole life. You know, you're saved by grace and not by law, but you better do right and keep the law or you won't be saved. I call that backdoor legalism. Paul stated it clearly, you are not under the law but grace. But why, friends? Why wallow in our disease when our God is the great physician? Jesus wants to free you, to heal you. Come to him. Allow him to break the cycles of sin. That is the role of the Spirit. That is the role of discipleship. That's where I believe Jesus is taking new creation. Sin is a brutal master, a monster, a demon. But the cross of Christ is a line in the sand. And Jesus is our Savior, our Lord, and our God. He alone has the authority to say to our sin, you cannot pass. If you have not accepted this grace, if you have not accepted this Savior, this Lord, this God as your Savior, I hope you won't leave today without doing so. As a matter of fact, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I invite you, before this service is over, to make sure you talk to someone. Talk to, we have Aaron right here. Aaron's one of our head elders, right? Here. Talk to Aaron. I can hear Pastor Frank out there saying amen. I can't see him. There he is. He's over there. Um, I can hear to see what, Pastor Dana, are you here? She's way in the back, over there. All of our elders, where are you, elders? Find one of these. Say, I, I need 
to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. I want the full good news. Don't leave without prayer. We have prayer warriors here as well who will pray for you. Don't leave without prayer. However, our prayer warriors stand up and just, I mean, literally stand up. Stand up so you can see you. Find one of them and say, I need prayer. I need the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, guys. So if you have not accepted the full gospel, do so. I'm just short. I know this sounds like an old-fashioned 19th century uh, revival sermon. That's because it's an old-fashioned 19th century revival sermon. <laughs> Let's break the cycle of sin by the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Pray with me. Father God, you've given us such a gospel. A gospel of grace where Jesus came and he lived and he died and he took evil upon himself. All of evil. He took it upon himself. But even evil could not withstand him. Jesus walked away from that tomb and we, we have such an advocate. We are forgiven of our sins. Hallelujah. But the good news goes further. Because I know that you do not want to leave us wallowing in our disease of sin. You want to heal us. You want to move us. You want to change us. You want to transform us. You want to give us the power to become a new creation. Father, give us that. Give us that power that comes by the grace of Jesus alone through the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray. I pray for those who Feel now the tug of the Holy Spirit saying, I want that. I want that, Lord. Give them the courage to come up and say, I need prayer. I need prayer. Lord, be with our church that we may become a hub where people are learning about the gospel, the full gospel. Coming to the Lord, and their lives are being transformed by Jesus Christ. May we be that kind of a church. Bring us people who are excited about being disciplined by grace, which is what it is to become a disciple. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.